Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our COIL conversation with Dr. Jean Lingerich on using online learning technology to support control of emerging infectious diseases. Uh, Dr. Lingerich is an epidemiologist who uses participatory data-based approaches to develop, test, and disseminate evidence-based strategies for the clinic and public health. His research has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, United States Department of Agriculture, Health Resources and Service Administration, and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, as well as professional and nonprofit organizations. So this COIL conversation is rather timely and will consider what online learning methods and information technologies could be developed in advance of an infectious disease outbreak and then rapidly deployed during an outbreak to foster authentic and measurable education and training of nationals. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to you. Good. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thanks, Bart, for the introduction, as well as to the folks from COIL here for giving me the opportunity to uh, present. I really appreciate it. Uh, Bart mentioned that this was a timely presentation. And uh, well, actually, speaking of timely, I was up this morning adapting it to some of the current events here, too. So um, I just appreciate the opportunity. We're going to go on uh, here. Uh, so. This slide shows us the outline that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, first of all, I'll, I'll just give you a brief orientation to a May 15th coil rig proposal that we put in, which is um, still an active uh, consideration. And partly due to, um, due to folks here, I've come back to kind of present this to the crowd and see what kind of input we can get. I want to frame this around the global health security agenda. Now, this was a big part of the proposal that we put together, uh, but that was back in May, which uh, was a different time and place than it is now. So we don't hear much about the agenda, but we're living in the midst of it. Uh, finally, or third, I want to talk about the Public Health Preparedness Program at Penn State here uh, that I have the opportunity to direct. Um, then go in a little bit to the Ebola crisis, and I, I want to walk you through, through some events that have happened uh, in the, particularly in the instructional area as we, as we look at the Ebola situation. And then the last part, we're going to throw it back to you all to talk about future directions. So uh, just a bit about the proposal that we put in and that we're still working on developing and re-putting in. Uh, this was a systematic assessment and development of e-learning materials for international health professionals in pandemic preparedness. This went in in the May 15th. Uh, round, and the next one is coming up in mid-November, so we look to revise this. Um, I'm really pleased with the group of folks that we had uh, participating in this. This was myself, uh, Matt Ferrari from, Bio from the uh, Everly College of Science, and he's the director of the Epidemics MOOC and is one of the leaders in uh, activities in this area on campus as well. Uh, Khaled Iskandarani is is a uh, project manager that works with me at college in the uh, College of Medicine at Hershey. Uh, and, and then Bushan Jaro is the, uh, is just to, the proposal was not only looking to, to capture human, but also animal components of this as well. So Bushan is the director of the Animal Diagnostic Lab of the uh, Ag Sciences here. Amy Nehans is with our College of Medicine's library, and she was going to do some research for us. Gavin McGregor Skinner, uh, you're, I'm going to talk more about him uh, in the future in this presentation here. And if you uh, tune into CNN and they're talking about Ebola there, he's often on Welcome. the, uh, on the uh, airwaves there. Uh, Bart Purcell, also from IST and from this program here, is a part of it. Cynthia Robinson is the director of the Library at College of Medicine, and she was going to help us out with some of the searching searches. Um, Alexander Siegschlag is the director of our Homeland Security program at Harrisburg, and then Dave Wolfgang is a person that I've come to know over the past couple of years and respect, and he's out there on the farms in real time uh, working with uh, individuals who are probably going to be at the key of future uh, pandemic situations. This was the abstract that we put in, uh, again, May 15th. So our goal was to establish Penn State as a major deliverer of innovative e-learning for health professionals in a pandemic preparedness. So first note is that uh, we had this goal for Penn State 
to really elevate itself in this area. We were focused on an audience of health professionals, not so much the public, but rather health professionals. And that's where I want to show, want to gear our later conversation today towards as well. As I mentioned before, we were really focused, keying on the global health security agenda, uh, which was uh, coming came out in February of like of this past year, and then the Ebola outbreak hit earlier in the spring. So when we were writing this, we weren't in the midst of that, but we were keying off of the agenda. And so in that agenda, then there was a, a layout to for the CDC, WHO, and other groups to partner with up to 30 countries to really help build infrastructure, public health infrastructure, in the laboratories, in the ministers of health, both in the healthcare uh, industry as well, to deal with potential pandemics as they arise. And what, what we wanted to do was to develop innovative training methods and materials and a platform that would support that, and specifically keying off of the global health security agenda. So we had three aims here to collect and analyze the assessment data. Again, this was assessment of training materials that existed already and that weren't really correlated or, or or, or, or available in any systematic fashion uh, in anywhere. And I'd, I'd, uh, I'll show you where we're at now as of about yesterday related to some of the Ebola stuff. Uh, we wanted to look at the scientific and gray literature around training as well and then develop an open repository of e-learning e training materials and methods. So that was the May 15th. Here's just a little bit about the global health security agenda. So they had these six goals to accelerate progress towards a world safe and secure from infectious disease threats, promote global health security. And I guess one of the things, particularly since our program I direct lies within the, the um, Homeland Security Program, we really do see the public health pandemic and preparedness as a health security issue, part of Homeland Security. Um, Wanted to prevent and reduce likelihood of outbreaks, detect threats and, and save lives. Uh, rapid, effective response requires multi-sectorial international coordination and communication. And uh, they had $45 million in the uh, FY 2015 budget request at that point in time. And remember, we're talking about back in May. So since that time, there's been a lot of money coming through and continuing resolutions and elsewhere related to the whole Ebola outbreak and the pandemic, uh, pandemic preparedness. As I said before, the uh, Global Health Security Agenda had a number of partners, uh, CDC, Department of Defense, and the Department of State were at the center of it, uh, as well as the USDA and USAID, as well as 30 partner countries, as I mentioned, WHO, as well as the World Organization on, for, for Animal Health and part of the United Nations as well. So it was really an all-encompassing um, agenda that was being put forward. And we were hoping to kind of uh, key on that. Here are the specific objectives. I'm not going to go down and read these, but you can look at these later on. Uh, for the agenda, as it was put forward, it wanted to prevent, detect, and respond to, to uh, disease. Um, and, um, and I guess you can see a lot of this is playing out now as we hear and are involved in the Ebola uh, outbreak. So let me shift now and talk about public health preparedness in Homeland Security graduate program at Penn State University. Uh, this is the program that I have the opportunity to direct here. Um, we offer a Master of Professional Studies in Homeland Security, the public health preparedness option. It's 33 credits, uh, so typically individuals uh, finish it with 11 courses. It is on online, taught by the College of Medicine faculty and delivered to the Penn State World Campus, of course. We also offer a graduate certificate in public health preparedness, specifically focused on disaster and bioterrorism. That's 12 credits out of the core program, and it's also taught by the same faculty. This program began in 2006, so we've got almost eight or nine years' worth of experience in this. Uh, we admit about 50 students per year. There's usually a few physicians and PhD types in the class, uh, a few more master's degrees, but most of them are bachelor's degrees, about two-thirds or th two 
of their masters. And as is typical for a lot of these masters, a lot of these online masters programs, it, it's largely composed of professionals uh, who have uh, busy lives and other professions, careers, things like that. And we work around their schedules the best we can as well. Um, I guess I'll mention it here because I forget if it comes up later. This is the only public health preparedness program that's taught in the College of Medicine throughout the United States. Uh, it was started that way and still is that case. Um, and so I th think we have a particular role to play in the healthcare industry right now. Um, so our goal is to advance the knowledge and competencies of students so that they lead domestic and global efforts to minimize the health effects of disease outbreaks, mass exposures, natural disasters, and terrorist and criminal activities. So it's a pretty broad goal that we're involved with. And our vision uh, is to be a global leader in online graduate training in uh, online prepared, help with health preparedness. We have a set of uh, goals and related to knowledge that we hope to achieve. Uh, we want individuals to be able to explain biologic, epidemiologic, and medical implications of a variety of events, including those biologic ones. We want them to understand the importance of a global health perspective uh, and to uh, be able and conversant to uh, giving a history of how pandemic, how, how public health preparedness has developed over the years in, in the, um, within the Homeland Security environment. Uh, we do have a lot of individuals who are involved with public health or emergency response or law enforcement or military. So they, we need to emphasize what the role of them uh, is, is in this as well. And I guess it's particularly relevant because now as we see uh, sending uh, military individuals over to uh, West Africa to help set up uh, um, preparedness there. Uh, we do go through a comprehensive review of what public health preparedness is all about, preparation, response, mitigation. And um, evidence-based practice is an important part, part of what we teach. Uh, we try to emphasize that while they, there is a lot of uniqueness to each response, there are some commonalities, and we need to be searching for these. And as part of a master's program, and that's what we expect our students to be able to do. Uh, we do try to focus on some competencies, not just knowledge as well. We want them to be able to apply the methods of public health research and evidence-based practice. Again, that evidence-based practice is, is pervasive throughout our program. We want them to know how to do vulnerability assessments with an all-hazards approach, not specifically focused on, uh, on tsunamis or bioterrorism or natural uh, biological events, but using an all-hazards approach, which is the approach that's, uh, that's, that's propagated now across the uh, homeland security environment. We want them to understand about communicating issues related to risk, laboratory, and health information. Um, they uh, develop and test plans for protection of critical infrastructure and key resources for hospital and health systems. We have a whole course on that. Uh, we want them to be uh, cognizant of the community response then as well, because uh, I think as, as you can imagine, it really is the community response that's key to uh, the preparedness and response that might, might happen effective if it's going to be effective locally. We want them to understand a bit about investigating a disease outbreak or exposure, uh, managing health system surges and emergency medical response. I'm really pleased with a new faculty member that we've got coming on board, Jim Holloman. He is in emergency department uh, physician, uh, and he is uh, he's the president of the International Association of Emergency Department Physicians uh, and has quite a lot of experience around the world. So he's a new faculty member just brought, on, brought back to Penn State Hershey, and we're pleased that he's part of the system now, too. Uh, health of responders and volunteers is always important, as we're now seeing uh, just yesterday with the uh, confirmation that uh, one of the physicians from Doctors uh, Without Borders was now is now a uh, who was treating patients there now is a patient himself, and we want them to track and disease exposures and occurrences. Uh, our values we have a number of values that we try to put forward in here: evidence-based practice. I've already said that uh, we want to instill integrity, respect, and service, and not instill it, but actually uh, foster it. Uh, lifelong learning. Uh, that's not difficult among this crowd. They, as I said, are typically 35 or 40 years of age, and they're coming back for more education here. Quality and safety is important. Critical 
thinking, research methods, and data analysis. This is not a research program, but we do introduce some issues around research methods and data analysis, particularly in our epidemiology course. And then team-based action, one of the, uh, one of the uh, critical but often difficult things to do in an online program because of the schedules of everybody. Here are the core courses that we offer, 410 and 510 are complementary courses. Uh, giving the history and background around preparedness for disaster and terrorist emergencies. Then we do have a 527, which is an epidemiology and exposure evaluation course. As I said, 530 is our critical infrastructure protection of healthcare delivery systems. Uh, in, in the past, we focused largely upon sort of the, uh, the overall structure, such as uh, cyber and electricity and and uh, water systems. I think now we're going to incorporate a lot more about uh, personal protective equipment as well. Uh, 594 is the capstone project that all master students are required to do. There's individual studies. We've had a number of students take advantage of that recently. Uh, they can get from one to nine credits in that area. And then we've had a couple of new courses that have been taught over the past year. Uh, what happens after the emergency response plan is developed? How do you can do exercises? How do you evaluate it? How do you revise the plan? that a hospital has in place. And then finally, uh, a biosafety safety risk and preparedness uh, course is offered as an elective as well. So we do graduate a few people. Uh, there are 13 people in this slide here. Uh, four of us are faculty, and the other nine are students. This was May 2014 at Hershey. Uh, we do, uh, com uh, the com if they graduate in the spring and want to come to commencement, they would come to Hershey to be able to participate in this. But you can get a sense of of the mixture of people that are in the uh, in this program. So our faculty are uh, myself and Jim on the end, Jen Ostek. Uh, she's with the Coast Guard, came up from the Washington, D.C., Baltimore area for the for the commencement. And then Gavin McGregor Skinner, who is uh, is in the Washington, D.C. area, but he's also uh, been to Nigeria, where he was actually controlling the uh, setting up the biosafety for the hospital there, and he was also the biosafety risk management at uh, Emory for the past couple of patients that have been there as well. So now let's shift over and just talk a little bit about the Ebola uh, situation. Um, so here's a couple of slides, uh, some general information about how to prevent it, obviously focused upon the uh, West African situation, uh, and then all, we all recognize the sign of the Texas Health Presbyterian here and the Dallas uh, Hospital where it's been a focus of attention over the past couple of weeks as well. Um, so, you know, this is, this is kind of shifting over not only to the Ebola but issue, but what I want to do is focus upon training and preparedness of hospital and healthcare uh, infrastructure. So, uh, last night and this morning I was doing a little bit of search, so I just hit Google search uh, for Ebola training materials and to see what comes up. And let me walk you through a few things here. Uh, so, we're good on our, we're projecting, okay, good. So here's an Ebola tool, toolbox, comes up from Medbox. I'm not sure that I know what Medbox is, but it was the first hit on Google search. So um, they know how to get up there at the top. What do they have on board? Well, here's a consolidated Ebola virus disease pre preparedness checklist, uh, some clinical management. So let's take a look at what these things might be. Well, these just happen to be, um, uh, you know, some 113 pages available for download. Uh, to uh, talk about how to clinically manage patients with a viral hemorrhag hemorrhagic fever. So if we uh, kind of, so that's, one, that's our first hit. Well, I'm glad the second hit came from CDC. Uh, so here is, their, uh, here is their site. So what, are, what kind of things are they getting out there for information and training purposes? Um, so we can find out about the latest outbreak information from case counts. Uh, we might be able to get some PSAs here from, um, in local language, that seems really useful, particularly focused upon the African uh, area. Uh, we can get some, even some PSAs from the Carter Center. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Here are the videos. Let's take a look and see what they have in the way of videos. So here's some information about what an airline crew and staff need to know, a six minute, 15 minute video to teach every uh, airline stewardess and, uh, about what they need to know about handling Ebola patients. And we, have, we can argue whether that's going to be sufficient or not. Um, so if you have a question, who do you respond to? Who do you get back in touch with? Well, I don't quite know. I don't see that on this list of videos here that we're talking about. Um, how to do contract tra contact tracing is, a, uh, is another uh, piece. We can just kind of click on that and see what pops up here. Um, 
And I can imagine that the first idea, a really important piece here, I was at CDC for the epidemic the intelligence. The Ebola outbreak is the largest Ebola outbreak in history and the first ever in West Africa. At CDC, our mission is to prevent... Okay, so this almost seems like a promotional material for CDC as well, as opposed to very much in the area of training. Not that that's not important, but the training piece is what people are screaming for. Um, and so that's the second hit on our uh, Google search. Um, so let's look at the third one, still CDC here. So this is actually focused on hospital training, training healthcare workers. So what does CDC offer in the way of retraining healthcare workers? Well, if you scroll down through this here, you can go to a three-day course in Anniston, Alabama. Uh, you have to apply, and they have, uh, they have a long waiting list right now. And in fact, I just got a, a uh, I was on a, uh, a fairly large listserv three days ago where they're looking for people to come and offer train, to be part of the training process. So we're now even looking, at, looking for trainers to come and train these people who are about to go to West Africa to deal with patients there. So, but you have to go to West Am you have to go to uh, spend three days in, uh, in uh, Anniston, Alabama to be able to do this. Um, and look at this, they're filled up through October. They are accepting applications starting next week. That's good, I guess. Uh, but, you know, they're only projecting out through uh, December here. And I don't think that matches the plea that we've been hearing from a variety of people. So that's just an idea of what you get if you hit Google search. Um, so uh, Penn State, CNN, and the Elizabeth R. Griffin Foundation have been involved in some of this as well, particularly through one of our faculty members, Gavin McGregor Skinner. Um, and so let me just, if I can, uh, I don't have a clock. How are we doing on time? 10.22. Okay, good. Um, so uh, let's just go through some of the videos. Um, he's been a regular on CNN. He's on there last night as well talking about some of the updates, but this is, uh, uh, you can just, I'm going to walk you through a few things that, uh, that have happened over time. Uh, so first of all, here is the, uh, this is an October 1 publication, uh, October 1 um, uh, video uh, where, uh, where uh, the, the uh, CNN and uh, our Gavin McGregor Skinner are talking about why hospitals, only a few hospitals, are prepared for accepting Ebola patients. Um, uh, we probably, uh, is that coming? Yeah, okay, so let's skip over that. So anyway, um, it's, I, it, it's uh, let me try it just one more time here because they do have some good, uh, good clips in here. When it comes to how many American hospitals are really prepared to Are we getting double? Case, we both tabs are, are playing. Uh, they knew they were coming in advance. They had a chance to prepare, prep the staff. This Texas case, this is the first walking. Again, remember, this is October 1. The hospital clearly stumbled. And that, say, infectious disease experts really needs to change. And here's our faculty member. We have a lot of hospitals that are prepared and really probably don't even want patients. And so what we've seen, we've seen that our hospitals now are downloading paper-based guidance. October 1. From the internet, and they're now working out how oh, to management, you. how to do the management, how to do the implementation, how, to, how is the how, how to make these things happen to ensure that if they do unfortunately get an Ebola patient, everyone in the hospital is going to be safe. Okay, so that's an example. Let's just skip out there, but that's an example of what they were doing October one. We had a lot of PDFs for them to download. Um, let's uh, let's uh, jump back here. So um, so um, uh, so anyway, hospitals downloading paper guidance. Those were the no that was a note. There's mountains of uh, infectious disease waste that people that hospitals have to deal with. Uh, and then it goes on to talk about drill, 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 you know, get prepared for this, get prepared, run through exercises. So now let's jump forward to October 15th and uh, where there is a call now for a hospital training program that's particularly at, uh, at the, we probably won't necessarily, well, I want to start this, but there's a call for a national hospital healthcare training program um, at, at minute 420 in this. Uh, and so uh, again, so we'll just watch this for a couple of minutes here. He's an infectious disease expert and works at Penn State. Doctor, 
help me understand this because we listen to the CDC, we listen to the Texas public health officials, and they say we are doing, you know, we, we, we you know, decontaminated here, and this is under control, and we've done this, and we've done that, and then in the same breath they say we're very concerned. So what we've been told now by the CDC is breach of protocol. That's what happened here. Something that this nurse was supposed to be doing wasn't done. Do you go with that? No, I don't, Andy. The nurse was doing her job looking after Mr. Duncan and, and had visited and seen him, had direct you know, close contact numerous times. This whole idea of the breach of protocol, we're underestimating what it takes to actually do patient care for an Ebola patient. It's about management. It's about supervision. So again, we heard Dr. Frieden talk about this morning that it needs to be an investigation. But the part of the investigation, that shouldn't be the government, that should be a neutral party that goes down there, turns that investigation into lessons learned, and looks at the management and the supervision in that hospital for the hospital staff. And so what you mean by that is that the nurse was nursing, and someone should have been overseeing that in the room with her or outside the door. Is that where you think the, the problem was? Exactly. And in for a highly infectious disease like Ebola, we teach a system called the buddy system. And that's where if you and I were treating the bowel patient, I'd be watching you, you'd be watching me. I don't do anything unsupervised. If I go anywhere, you come with me. And we teach this from, you know, throughout the world in treating highly infectious diseases. Where was her buddy? And what? And so if, if, if that nurse made a mistake, and again, the breach of protocol, the protocol's got a piece of paper. So it comes down to how much training did she get, how much supervision did she get. And if you see a breach, which she's under, she should be under good supervision, you'll say, hang on, you made a mistake. We need to decontaminate you. Elizabeth, when you listened to the CDC this morning, uh, we heard... Okay, so let's just go back to our presentation here. So you can see what we're talking about. Again, at, at, at minute 420, we won't get there right now in interest of time, but that's where they call for a national hospital training program. Um, so now, uh, so around uh, October uh, 20th, 20, somewhere around the 19th, 20th, I, we were text, Gavin and I were texting, and I said, give me some videos of how to do that, how, how do you put this stuff on? So, um, and uh, it was interesting because here on, uh, on October 21st, you actually saw it from the, uh, if, if, we, if we go back to the previous slides, you can see how it is, uh, I want to pause this here. Okay, I want to pause this and get back here. Um, so if we go back to this earlier link here, which is, uh, which is a live link now, but you can see here, October 21st was when the Elizabeth R. Griffin Foundation first put on their website videos, YouTube videos, about how to take on and off personal protective equipment. Uh, it was also about three nights ago, I was looking at the, uh, there was a CDC had put up a, uh, a video of the New York hospitals, as a matter of fact, in mass, going through that same kind of training. So again, you know, it's coming. But here it is, you know, October 15th, 20th, before we're getting any kind of, we're getting very many videos up about how this has happened, yet we're hearing other, other stories about, you know, how this is all management, observing and such. So, so we are, so it is, it, is, uh, it is coming on board here. So now let's just go back. This is, the, uh, this is the video that was put up, um, and there's other ones that have come on board too, but this is, this is one example of what's put up. Um, and remember, this is starting in what we have to think about is West Africa and low-resource hospitals, not just in West Africa but elsewhere. So this is, uh, this is one, of the one, one of the instructions that's up here on board. A Michael Kim mat is prepared once a day. The mat must be taped down on all four sides and secured to the floor. The area within the red border should be considered a clean zone and must remain clean at all times. The mat should be dated. The mat is soaked using a solution made up of a ratio of one part microchem to two parts water, typically 200 milliliters of microchem solution to 400 milliliters of water. Okay. When it's time to leave the patient's room, your personal protective equipment, or PPEs, must be properly doffed Okay, so you get a sense of the uh, kind of training that that video shows, uh, clearly for a, a well-resourced place, and that's important. Now, uh, just a few days ago, uh, Nigeria was declared Ebola-free by the WHO, so let's listen to a little bit about what, again, Gavin has to say about, uh, and he was there doing this, he was partly responsible for achieving this, but let's hear what he has to say about how it was achieved 
in Nigeria. All right, returning now to one of our top stories this hour and the WHO is this October 20th. Nigeria as a shining example of how Ebola can be contained. Let's find out more about this. Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner is an infectious diseases expert who trained Nigerian healthcare workers for the Elizabeth R. Griffin Research Foundation. He joins us now here uh, in the studio. Uh, doctor, it's great to have you. Uh, first off, um, you, you were involved in the training of the healthcare workers in Nigeria. What did they do so right that now they're able to be declared Ebola free? Well, it seems that the Elizabeth R. Griffin Research Foundation was not only invited by the Nigerian government, but paid for by the Nigerian government to go to Nigeria, and the Nigerian government had a plan. It was a whole of community plan to use all the toolbox, all the tools in the toolbox, and all their past experiences, not to create an environment of fear within the community and the hospitals, but to create a positive environment to a very well developed and implemented communication plan. And it was that communication plan that was so important. Communication plan. Yep. Uh, so they were clearly prepared, as you say, but let, remind us how Ebola entered Liberia, because all the ingredients were there for a potential outbreak. Yes, it was. And, and, and the one patient that, that traveled from Liberia to Lagos, now remember Lagos is a, is a mega city, 21 million people. Many people had made comment, if it gets to Lagos, a mega city of 21 million people, we are in big, big trouble. The Nigerian communication plan included a 1 800 Ebola help number. They made a government Facebook page, a Twitter page. They used text messaging to get that message out, not just to hospital staff, but to all of the community. And they, this is government, non-government, multinationals, corporations, academia. They brought everyone into the one room. And that really was, was the key to success in Nigeria. Okay, but you, you trained, you helped train healthcare workers in Nigeria, and I'm curious to know what the protocols were that were in place, because we're seeing a lot of criticism in Spain and the U.S. that the healthcare workers who are the front line of defense against Ebola weren't properly trained. So what exactly are they doing in Nigeria, the healthcare workers, that we're not seeing in other countries? The Nigerian government made a decision very early on that there would be only two hospitals in Nigeria at the beginning to treat the long-term care of Ebola patients. That's significant. They, they, we set up a hospital isolation ward in Lagos and a hospital isolation ward in Port Harcourt, working again with the World Health Organization, CDC, and Doctors Without Borders. At those hospitals, we developed the buddy system and the supervision management systems that need to be in place so that every hospital within the country knew that if they got a suspected Ebola patient, that it was going to go to one of two hospitals. And that was the big difference. And at those hospitals, the people, the, the nurses at the hospital said, how do we do this? Well, you and I work together as a buddy, as a team, and then we have a third person doing the supervision, and they had a supervisory checklist. Whenever there was a mistake, stop, I need to decontaminate you. They put in that management, implementation, and supervision that was so important for Ebola. But clearly, there, there was a clear plan in place. But talk about the resources, though, in West Africa, because I looked at the numbers, and they're quite astounding. It's just how desperate some of these countries like Sierra Leone need the simplest things, such as gloves and, and the proper gear to wear. The attention, do you think, should be focused on these West African countries and containing the virus there and getting the money and the resources that they need first? And again, another good model that the Nigerians can provide is they use local resources to, to come up with solutions to local problems. So if we didn't have the white suit, we didn't have the gloves, we didn't have the face mask, the face shield, they would use plastic bags, garbage bags. We went down to the market with them and we bought bleach from the supermarket to decontaminate the hospitals. We went down to the supermarket to buy waterproof rain jackets for people uh, in the staff hospitals that didn't have the white suits. As long as we can ensure that no, no parts of your body are exposed, we can take that, 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 that contaminator, with that, those, those clothes with millions of beings of virus, we can take them off under supervision carefully, we can de decontaminate them, then we're going to kill. As far as the virus is only transmitted through the eyes, the nose, and the mouth through the direct contact of virus in all those different bodily fluids we talk about. Okay, so what I, I wanted to get to that point in this video to uh, contrast what he said they did in Nigeria versus that part of that video that we saw. I didn't see any raincoats, I didn't see any bleach, I didn't see those sorts of things in that. So we have this real juxtaposition of what uh, of, 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 of those two issues. So uh, let's go on here. I thought I got to look at the American Hospital Association, so what are they saying? Um, and uh, about training. So here we can actually, here we have some interactive area. So I can submit my question to the AHA right here. Uh, this is what it looks like. 
Uh, and I, so I have to put my first name, last name, email, organization, and my comment in here and submit it. Uh, there, you know, I can go to any, most any online retail store and interact and chat with somebody. I don't think that's what this is set up to do, but this is yet the American Hospital Association. So at least we're seeing that there's some opportunity for response, but I think there's, a, there's some interaction. So um, that's what's on the American Hospital. The, they do have, actually, I got to give uh, credit here because um, they are, they seem to be a fairly central place for some other issues. And there's a lot of PDFs in here as well, but if we scroll down towards the bottom, here's some other, other, um, other resources. So actually, Kentucky and Texas and Tennessee are getting on board with posting information as well, uh, a tabletop exercise for your hospital. So again, we're, we're, it, it's, it, it's becoming more available, but this is at the AHA site, and um, I, I'm hoping our hospitals are looking at this. So going on, so just recently, private donations have been, have been rolling in as well. They usually make a headline for a bit. Uh, here we have Mark Zuckerberg from fa Facebook. He's donating $25 million to the CDC founder. Uh, Microsoft co-founder Paul, co Paul Allen pledges $100 million. He's giving it to the U.S. State Department to develop medevac containment units for eva to evacuate health people from uh, West Africa and to the University of Massachusetts Medical School to donate funds to train medical workers and equipment in Liberia. And the Gates Foundation announced that it was giving $50 million to support the scale up of emergency efforts in West Africa and interrupt the transmission. This is going to WHO, UNICEF, CDC, uh, larger organizations. Uh, but I guess the thing that struck me when I put this together here are these people coming from major uh, tech industries and yet you know, it, 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 some, of the, some of the tech components of this just don't seem to be coming through for me. So what I wanted to do was to present today was to, um, and this I think I put in the objectives here, so uh, how can we, this is the pose back to the audience here, so how can we take this uh, situation uh, to consider what sort of online learning methods and information technologies could be developed in advance of an infectious disease outbreak. Again, I wrote this about a month or a month and a half ago when we were first talking about getting this thing together, so the situation was a little bit different with Ebola at that point in time. Uh, and so I threw out some ideas here. Crowdsource data. So where are we talking about crowdsource data? I mean, certainly this, sort of, this kind of thing seems like it could be useful for uh, the Nigerian situation that Gavin described, to be able to learn where, where material supplies, resources are, where patients might be. Google Glasses, I mean, could this be used for some sort of training purposes as well? Uh, discourse analysis, is anybody looking at what's going on? I know other people are looking at some Twitter information about Ebola, but really is it focused around being able to mobilize training capacity that we need to do? Uh, how do we recognize that people have been trained? Uh, is there a particular way that we can do that? Is there some sort of machine learning component here? One thing we've been talking about is, uh, and it's not getting so rapid anymore, but a rapidly deployed MOOC. How do we move, how do we roll these things out quickly in response to particular, particular situations? Uh, you know, waiting three, six, ten months to develop something with lots of videos and well laid out ahead of time um, isn't going to meet the call that we've been hearing. So we've been putting together a little bit of a plan for a rapidly deployed MOOC. Again, working with the Elizabeth Griffin Foundation, Pfizer, uh, and doing some training. We were thinking of seeing how this might be able to roll off of the world campus. And Angel, again, taking advantage of some of the things that we have on board with our um, public health preparedness option in the Homeland Security and the world campus. Uh, this was uh, in conjunction with some of the uh, universities in the uh, West African area, again in Nigeria, because of connections there. So that's something that we'd love to think about and see if we could do more of that. So what would the characteristics of some sort of innovative training platform program be? be? Well, of course, it has to be timely. And one of the things that, that I think it has to be is interactive and monitor. I mean, we need peers and professionals. Uh, obviously, from uh, Gavin's presentation, the issue of peer, peer interaction is incredibly important, but there's also a component of professional. Uh, it has to be accurate, of course. Is there a place for crowdsourcing? How can it be low cost and capitalize upon local, local resources? We don't want to uh, forget that. So I'm going to stop at this point in time and just kind of flip back to this slide here, but I'd really love to hear from uh, you all uh, about your thoughts about where we might go with the training program. Uh, again, remember that we had uh, developed that May 15th proposal for a um, uh, for a uh, kind of a learning platform for pandemic preparedness before we got in the midst of this uh, 
uh, this outbreak in the situation. So I'm going to stop at that point and hopefully we get some questions and comments. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I see some coming in here. I see some people still typing. So, so as you were talking, uh, I just have one quick question, then we'll jump into the, the people online. I didn't see any mention of kind of an emerging field that several IST people seem to be interested in, and it's ICT slash DM. So uh, I think it's information communication technology for disaster management. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And they focus most of their efforts on things like tsunamis, like things that happen in Haiti and things like that. Mm -hmm. Are the things that you're talking about here with how people are, are responding to Ebola and making efforts to, to better use technology to kind of train people, do you know if those communities are, are sort of overlapping now or if that community is strictly looking at kind of natural disasters and, and, and not addressing things uh, here? No, no, I don't, I, I don't think so at all. I think that there is a lot of overlap. Um, so there are a couple of options within the Homeland Security program. One is cybersecurity, who, and that's been directed by Pete Forrester mm -hmm. from his dean's office over there. So we uh, are in communication about this. We just met last week about some uh, taking a, uh, a tool that they have for crisis management mm -hmm. and adapting it specifically to the Ebola situation. But I guess one of the things that we've got to keep in mind if we're going to be players in this rapidly developing mm -hmm. process, you know, we it's not something that can take months and months or a year to be able to develop because then it's going to be too late. So we've got to keep that in mind and I think that's incredibly hard for us in academia to think about doing. Absolutely. So yes, we are talking with, with those sorts of folks. I don't know a whole lot about the technology and the tech methods that you would that you that you mentioned, but I'd be happy to learn and I think that, that can be some maybe that can be some some part of what we would respond with. No, that's great. I just I just know my affiliation there. So people mm -hmm. are looking at that domain and right. ST, so it's great that you're working with uh, I see Kyle has a question. I don't know, Kyle, if you want to activate your audio because I see you have a mic there. If not, I can certainly relax. Sure. Uh, so, hi, Gene. Thanks. Uh, good introduction and uh, hugely important topic. I, I think that two things you said are really interesting. Discourse analysis, sort of watching, well, more than two. <laughs> the discourse analysis, watching sort of Twitter and, and maybe crowdsourcing kinds of uh, opportunities to to plot things on maps, you know, we have people here that are able to take IP addresses and sort of geocode things, and people could, you know, with photographs and things now are putting pretty, pretty real uh, location stamps on photos and things. And there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to to build things that aren't don't happen quickly. Uh, but if you build a tool, I mean, we're talking about an Ebola outbreak now, and of course, there's a sense of urgency around that. I'm with you on that, but things developing things that will take time will also be valuable for future uh, viruses and future emergencies of different types. I think that we, we do, I just wanted to mention, we do have people here at Penn State uh, working on discourse analysis and working with other people at other institutions on that. And I can introduce you to those people. You also mentioned maybe a badging thing. How do we know who's been trained and on what? And uh, how do we encourage people, maybe even lay people, to, to learn what they need to know about different diseases as they come out. And those things take relatively little time to put together. Um, they can include media from all kinds of different sources. You can choose the best. You can curate the best information for people for, of different categories, <clears throat> people who are professionals in the field, people who are not professionals in the field, maybe who are the airline uh, attendants and other people in the world, different you know, subway uh, personnel and so on. And also, I think there's a lot for the general public to know, and these, you know, using badging as a certificate for that would be, I think, important. And you can get proactive, so you can have them learn things like this, the training that, that is backed up now uh, that you mentioned, the, the, where they have to actually have to go to Atlanta or someplace and, and get trained. Maybe we can do some of those kinds of things in online ways that make sense. Um, and maybe crowdsourcing the peer review of some of the, the lower lower level, low, less um, you know, life and death kind of experiences. So I think there are opportunities here to do some things that would be quick and some things that wouldn't be quick, all of which might be important uh, in this and in future outbreaks. Uh, well, yeah, I agree completely. I, and, and I put this long li this list here because these were things that I had thought about. Uh, I'm not an expert in much of any of these things, so that's why I'm, I'm here kind of pleading for other people to join this team that might be able to help bring some more innovation and some more uh, 
uh, technology to what we're what we're thinking about here as well. Absolutely. So there's a, another question here from Vicki. She says, in addition to the initial training program that needs to be widely distributed quickly, has any thought been given to a mobile performance support app to support the initial training when medical personnel are in uh, on site or in the field? Uh, gee, great question, Vicki. Uh, boy, not to my knowledge, sounds like a ripe area that we could uh, incorporate into this piece as well. So again, Vicki, if that's your expertise, we'd be happy to, uh, uh, to talk to you more about how that might look. So this isn't exactly, uh, it's tied to the Ebola crisis, not necessarily the training aspect. But I was just curious, being an expert in, in, in the spread of infectious disease, what your thoughts are here. I saw some recent articles that there are certain universities now that are rejecting applicants from not just Nigeria, but from, from all of Africa. Mm -hmm. Is that, I don't, I'm just curious what your or universe, some universities overreacting mm -hmm. that are putting in this policy of just flat out well, I haven't. Applicants. Well, I haven't heard of any any universities rejecting stu, uh, student applications. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard of them rejecting that. Yeah, I think that's a bit over the top. Um, well, if it goes over the top, I guess that's a you know that if they do do it anyway, there's a great opportunity for World Campus to move forward as well. Um, but I do think it's over the top. I think that we are uh, we're relatively fortunate. I mean, the big this, Ebola is scary because of you know its presentation. But and it, and and the high this one with the high fatality rate, uh, but it, its infectivity is lower than what we can expect in some mm -hmm. in some other pandemic situations. So we have to be prepared for that sort of thing. Um, so in that case, maybe it would be. Um, I know a lot of universities, you know, have put in travel restrictions and mm -hmm. expectations for individuals who have been to West Africa, uh, to the to the countries where Ebola is to not appear on campus yeah. uh, for a period of time. Uh, and so, you know, that I think probably seems to be a reasonable thing to, to put in place. Uh, we're seeing that sort of thing with all of our healthcare workers and uh, emergency people that are, re that are returning back from having been to that area as well. So that seems like a, a reasonable thing to do. Yeah, great. Kyle commented in the, uh, in the section here about using some of the technology, and I think this goes off the list that you had up a few seconds ago, particularly with Google Glass or perhaps something with virtual reality with Oculus Rift or the like. Uh, but Kyle mentioned perhaps technologies could be used to provide the, the buddy uh, that Gavin is calling for without having that person actually yeah. there exposed, heightening their risk right. uh, to exposure, whether it be cameras in the treatment room, Google Glass, or, or right. similar. There are a number of different similar devices being developed now right. uh, in the treatment rooms with the, report, the remote participant reading off a checklist. Mm -hmm. uh, observing what's going on mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and essentially being able to have a, a set of individuals that don't have to be on site right. to provide that extra personnel that may not be available in right. those areas with fewer resources. Right, right. That could be part of a badging system then as well. Absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. It, you're, you have the badge, you're certified to be right. a remote observer. Right, 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 right. Yeah, great idea. Um, yeah. So my... Uh, comments appear and then they disappear so yeah. I can't continue to watch what's happening. Uh, so Vicky it, it came in up as I was saying that and said or could the app be the buddies and the in the app of right. individuals speaking out the checklist mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. to remind the individual of what's going on and, and without the additional technology of having right. video streaming which right. depending on your type of network connectivity somewhere may be difficult to do right. uh, but instead simply a voice, a mm -hmm. non corporeal voice coming out and saying do this, did you do this, did you do this, mm -hmm. and I've been walking through the checklist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really tough, I think you mentioned, showing the videos to try and imagine what it must be like in some of the low resourced areas. Oh yeah. In Africa, I mean, in Africa. Well, like how, what does this actually look like? Well, and that was, um, so last night on the uh, on the news hour, I, they were doing their usual thing of an Ebola thing, and they were talking to the director of the Office of Science and Technology in the White House, and he was and they were saying, so you know, what does science and technology, not medicine per se, have to contribute to this? Well, he said, well, one of the things that we have now with this PPE stuff is it's 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 hot, and you know we're expecting people, and typically people can wear it for 20 minutes, 40 minutes mm -hmm. in a hot 
sticky environment like it is in West Africa, and then they have to take it off and cool down themselves. So he's look, he says the technology people are now looking at how can we make these things more breathable, a little bit more comfortable, so that people can wear them for a longer period of time and don't have to continue going through that process of taking them off. Yeah. So the environment is an incredibly important piece of this then as well. So I don't see any more questions. Uh, I don't know, Gene, if, if you have any. Well, I guess the thing I would like to say is then um, I'm happy to have been able to present this. I guess what I would really encourage people to do is uh, if you particularly are, you know, if you have some expertise in some of these technological innovative things, uh, please be in touch and let's see how we can talk together about what this might look like. Uh, you know, in the immediate nature, I'd like to put in, uh, you know, we can take that, that current uh, proposal that we have, revise it, put it back in. Um, that still seems like a long period of time. Uh, maybe we can put something forward again in a more rapid fashion for some other other uh, other funding, other expertise to contribute to this. I think we've got a great platform for with the World Campus. We've got some good international partners, um, and the need is there right now. Yeah, so if you are, uh, you know, drop me a note. I can uh, flip this back up here so that you can uh, get in touch with me either through phone or through uh, through email, and uh, be happy to talk to you and see how what this might look like. Great. So I, I don't want to throw this to sound like a, a COIL commercial, but it's just there have been so many connections to this, you know, one of the new initiatives that we have had at COIL recently, which is this thing we're calling the COIL Connector, uh -huh. uh, which is a essentially a networking tool that allows you to put in okay. what your interests are, what your needs are, uh, and to see on a nice visual representation of who across mm -hmm. Penn State that is also in the system aligns with your needs, your mm -hmm. wants, your interests. Mm -hmm. uh, this may be a good place for us to connect you up uh, to get into the system and perhaps find great. some of this expertise right. that you're looking for right now. Yep. Yeah, we're looking for as many connections as we possibly can. And uh, Bart just put in the uh, the link to the coil connector in the chat, okay. so if anyone uh, remotely would like to, to, to jump onto that, you, you can do it so mm -hmm. there. And we'll have this on the COIL website at some point, probably next week, and Gene's contact information will be included there. So by all means, uh, please get in touch with Gene if you have expertise in these areas. And thank you very much, Gene, for coming and talking with us today. Well, thanks, Bart, and thanks for everybody for tuning in and for COIL for making this opportunity happen here. Great. Good. Thank you. Thank you very have much. Have a great weekend, everyone.